Welcome back to Econ 103, Introduction to Microeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at monopsony and a specific example of a monopsony, walking through how to calculate our optimal quantity, the figuring out the price that the monopsonist is going to charge, or not charge, but rather forced to be able to buy the stuff from, right? Keeping in mind our monopsonist is a single large buyer, so they get to push the price down in their favor. And then we're going to conduct a welfare analysis for the monopsonist. That is, we'll figure out, hey, what is our consumer producer social surplus before there was a monopsonist? And then we would take a look at what it looks like if instead this market was serviced by a monopsonist. So let's go jump over. Let's go take a look at this model and let's get started. So starting off here, what we have already showing for us, we have our initial demand initial supply right being shown already on the diagram demand and supply we've similarly also already solved for equilibrium price of 90 and quantity exchange of 12. again for refresher on how we did that we just set these two equations equal to each other consolidated and isolated the q's to solve for them once we had our q of 12 we take this 12 we put it back into either of the equations and we get our corresponding value for p Beyond that, we already have the initial consumer, producer, and social surplus already calculated for us. Again, where these guys come from, consumer surplus is just the area below my willingness to pay up to the quantity exchanged above the price I do pay. So that is this top triangle here. That's my consumer surplus. Producer surplus above my willingness to accept below the price I do accept, giving me my producer surplus. Together, the consumer and the producer, there's nothing else happening here, simplest case. So the two of them together, together give us our social surplus of 720. Okay, so that being said, this is what the market would look like if we had things being in our perfect competition, right? Perfect competition, lots and lots and lots of small buyers, lots and lots and lots of small sellers. Everything's working out. We're pushed to this allocatively efficient equilibrium where supply equals demand, marginal cost equals marginal benefit. From here, though, what happens if this market wasn't having lots of small buyers, but rather we just had one buyer? That is, you have everybody selling the good, lots and lots of small firms all selling goods, but only one firm buying it. An example of this is many agricultural co ops work in this kind of way. Let's say we're for orchards, you have hundreds of orchards all growing apples, and these apples are identical. So these hundreds of orchardists are growing thousands of apples, and they need to sell them. Well, in order to facilitate this sale, there is sometimes a fruit co-op that goes and buys all of these apples from all of the orchardists, and they're the only one who really is buying these apples. And then the co-op buys them, processes them, cools them, does everything that needs to be done with them, grades them and all that. And then this co-op then facilitates the sale onto your grocery stores, your markets and onwards. So that is from the orchardist's perspective, they only have one option to sell their apples. They have to sell it to this so-called fruit co-op. If they don't sell it to this fruit co-op, well, they might be able to sell little bits here and there on fruit stands, but we'll pretend that that's either not an option or so inconsequential that it doesn't really make a difference. That is, it's either sell it to this fruit co-op or nothing. Okay, in this scenario, because the only option is to sell to a fruit co-op, just like with our monopoly, how a monopolist ends up getting a marginal revenue that's twice as steep as a demand, well, from this case, from the one purchaser side, the purchaser, because for every extra good they purchase, they see a higher and higher price based off of the supply curve there. What we end up witnessing is a supply curve, sorry, not a supply curve, rather a marginal cost curve that is twice as steep as the supply. So if that was the supply of apples altogether, from the monopsonist viewpoint, the marginal cost of buying apples is significantly steeper. So that's marginal cost, monopsonist. So I'm just going to write monop, that's, uh, I should probably write the full thing, monopsony, just to make sure that we differentiate that from monopoly, right? Monopoly, that's the demand, the marginal revenue that gets impacted there. 
So from our perspective now, demand, well, this guy here, that's still the marginal benefit that is received. So our monopsonist being maximizing, they're going to equate their marginal benefit from buying these apples to their marginal cost of buying apples. They're going to get a point right about, right about here, where that marginal cost equals the marginal benefit. At this point, well, they're going to have our updated quantity bought and sold. So this will be our new quantity exchanged. We'll call it Q prime. And then we need to figure out, okay, at Q prime, what price are they going to ultimately end up paying for all these apples that they're buying? Well, we have a few different options that could occur. They could pay right here where their marginal cost equals their marginal benefit. They could, of course, pay what the market price should have been had it been perfectly competitive. Or, of course, what they could do is they could end up paying exactly what the sellers were willing to accept. And if we just think about it in this case here, they have the market power. The buyer has the market power. If you were the buyer, you would want to buy these goods for as cheap as you could. So this monopsonist pushes the price down to the lowest possible price. And that is they end up charging a price equal to the firm's willingness to accept. So we get our price as such. From that, how do we go about calculating them? Well, what we need to keep in mind is, hey, as we said here, this marginal cost curve, this is just twice as steep as our supply. So if this guy here, that's our supply, we get our price, that's the marginal cost, is going to be 30 plus 10Q. Original slope was 5, new slope is 10, twice as steep, we get our new curve. What we want to figure out in order to get Q prime is this intersection point right there, where marginal cost equals marginal benefit. So marginal cost equals marginal benefit occurring right there at that point. So demand equals marginal cost. So that's when 150 minus 5Q, that's our demand, equals our marginal cost of 30 plus 10Q. Okay, we now want to consolidate the Qs and then isolate them. So let's add 5Q to both sides. 150 equals 30 plus 15Q. Move this 30 back over. We get 120 equals 15Q. And 120 divided by 15, that gives us 8 equals Q. So again, that there, that is our Q prime. And we can update it to reflect as such. There we go. Eight as our quantity exchanged in this in this market due to the monopsonist being like, yeah, okay, I'm going to buy just a little bit less and I'm going to get a good price because of it. Now we need to figure out what exactly is this price. Well, to figure out what exactly is this price, we're going to take this eight and we're going to bring it up to our supply curve. Right, we're going to figure out, hey, what was our minimum willingness to accept for eight units? So, okay, supply curve, that's that one. We're going to have price of 30 plus 5Q, that's eight. So, five times eight, that's 40. 40 plus 30, we're going to get a price of 70. So, we can update that. Price of 70, that's that guy right there. So we see the monopsonist is able to restrict the amount that they're buying altogether and farther push down the price lower than that market equilibrium. From this point here, we figured out market quantity exchanged and we figured out the market clearing price. Thing we have left to figure out still is, well, our welfare analysis. We already have the initial consumer, producer, and social surplus. What's the new one? Who has won, who has lost because of this? So let's take a quick look at that. Starting off, let's take a look at the consumer. We'll just shade it in geometrically, identify it geometrically, and then solve it mathematically. So first, we have the consumer surplus. So below our willingness to pay up until the quantity exchanged, 
above the price that I do actually pay. So our consumers in this case get this big amount right here. And right, keep in mind the consumer is just the purchaser. So in this case here, it's still one business buying from another business, but it is the consumer, the purchaser, who is receiving all of that surplus. The producer surplus, well, this is gonna be above our willingness to accept up until that quantity exchanged below the price I do accept. So producers will get this whole red area as their producer surplus. Okay, let's go through calculating it, starting top to bottom. So starting off with our consumer surplus, consumer surplus one for the new one. That's, uh, that's a pretty funny shape. Well, we can't calculate that shape as it is, but what we can do is we can draw a line across at this point, and we can realize that this is now able to be broken up into easier shapes, that is a triangle and a rectangle. So by breaking it up into these two smaller shapes, we can then calculate each of these independently and then sum them together. So what we wanna do is we wanna take this eight, bring it all the way up to our demand curve, because right, eight to the demand, or marginal cost equals marginal benefit, drag that across, and we're gonna get the corresponding price. So doing so, putting that into the demand curve, what do we have? Price equals 150 minus five times eight. Okay, five times eight, we worked that out to be 40 already. 150 minus 40, that's gonna give me a price of 110. Okay, keeping in mind that price of 110, what, what exactly is that? Well, that there is the marginal cost to the monopsonist or the marginal benefit received by the monopsonist from the last unit purchased. Okay, from here we have everything we need to calculate the areas. So we're gonna calculate a triangle, we're gonna calculate a rectangle. So starting off with the triangle, that is one half base. We have a base of eight times height, 150 down to 110, that was 40. So we get eight times 40 times one half, that is 160. We get our rectangle base times height. We have a base of eight again. We have a height of 110 to 70, that is again 40. So in this case here, eight times 40, not one half eight times 40, but just strictly eight times 40, again, because 110 to 70, that's our 40 right there, we get 320. Add these two shapes up together, and what do we get? We get our total consumer surplus of 480. So $480 to the consumer. Taking a look, Consumer used to have 360, they now get 480. Yes, the consumer is much happier, they're much better off. But what about our other players? What about our other actors? What about the producer? Well, for the producer, we're looking at that triangle over there. So one half base, again, base of eight, times a height, 70 to 30 is our height. That distance right there. So again, that's gonna be 40. One half, eight times 40 is gonna be 100 and, oh, not 168, 160. So we see with respect to the original producer surplus of 360, our producers have clearly lost. They're clearly worse off given this scenario. How's society doing? Altogether, social surplus, is gonna be our producer plus our consumer. So that would be 160 plus 480, giving us social surplus of 640. We see in this context here, compared to the original of 720, our society is worse off as well. So throughout the whole scenario, we see that the consumers win, everybody else has lost. Last thing to talk about is the difference, the original social surplus of 720 versus the new one of 640. That difference, that loss to social surplus is our dead weight loss, and that works out to be 
eighty dollars. Seven twenty minus six forty. Where does that show up in the diagram? Well, in the diagram, that shows up as this yellow area here, the bit that we used to be able to receive as benefit for the consumers and the producers, but in which we no longer do. So our dead weight loss. Okay. That covers off our, monop our monopsonist, that is one large single buyer. In this case, we have worked through figuring out what is that quantity bought in the market, what is the price the monopsonist pays for it, and then we went through and we worked out our welfare analysis, figuring out consumer surplus, producer surplus, and altogether social surplus. Should you have any questions on this, please feel free to comment below or post on the D2L Frequently Asked Questions, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks, until next time.